this morning. I want to uh, welcome those who are watching this live or maybe uh, watching a recording of it later. We are glad to see you. Welcome. And uh, for those of you who, who are here in person, we are so glad you're here. Uh, I want to tell a quick story to start with as, as I move into the, the message this morning. When I was 20-something, in fact, I'm not even sure if I was married yet. I might have been married, but definitely 20-something. I worked for Youth Dynamics, and during that time, when I was working for Youth Dynamics, the president of the organization was, called, was uh, Paul Evans. Paul passed away last year, uh, amazing man of God, and Youth Dynamics celebrates 50 years this year. Um, and... God has impacted students' lives tremendously through that ministry, uh, so I just thought I'd give a little plug to them. But when I was 20-something, uh, I was working for Youth Dynamics, and something happened, and I, I was racking my brain trying to remember what happened, but something happened, and I didn't like how uh, Paul Evans dealt with it. Something in the whole organization that he laid down a rule, or he... Uh, dealt out some grant money or something like that happened. And I went, that's not right. Why would you do that? So I called him up and I said, Paul, may I come down and talk with you about this? Sure, yeah. Um, Paul had an open door policy. Not a problem. If he was in, if he wasn't already meeting with somebody else, you're more than welcome to come and, and talk with him. And uh, he, was, he was great that way. So I went down. Uh, made the hour's drive from Concrete to uh, Burlington, to the Burlington office. And I went up to Paul's office and I sat down. I'm almost positive it was financial in some way because I remember in my mind, I remember seeing a spreadsheet of some sort. And I started, well actually, I got a little perturbed, angry, and really kind of went into him disrespectfully and inappropriately, trying to understand no, I wasn't even trying to understand. I was just letting him know. I was not happy with what he had done, whatever it was. Now, my response was definitely inappropriate, disrespectful, angry, and uh, it wasn't very Christ-like. His response, on the other hand, has stuck with me for over 20 years. He never raised his voice. He didn't discipline, correct, rebuke me for my disrespectful attitude. Instead, he just answered my question. He explained carefully, graciously, why he chose to do what he did. And of all things, I ended up having to agree with him, God done it. But what has stuck with me for over 20 years is how he responded with grace and patience to this young kid who didn't deserve either one. And it stuck with me, and it is something that I have always come back to, saying, God, I need to have more of that attitude than what I really want to do. And I haven't got it down yet. But hopefully, by the grace of God, I am a little bit further along than I was last year, and definitely 20-some years ago. But I tell that story because I, I want you to grasp the importance of the example that you set. Because you don't know how that interaction with somebody is going to impact their lives for good or not. And I made a note in here to remark to you that doesn't mean Paul wasn't frustrated with me. That doesn't mean that he didn't go to his wife Connie afterwards and say, I have no idea why we hired that young man. He is so whatever. Fill in the blank. No, maybe you shouldn't fill in the blank. <laughs> <laughs> but by the Holy Spirit in him, he managed to maintain control of his emotions and set an example that I've never forgotten. So I want to talk about that as we enter into the second chapter of Titus this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, 
I thank you for the examples you've put in my life. And I pray that you would help us to be examples of Christ to others. Would you please give me the words to speak to know how to encourage us to do that, not just say Jesus and be done. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are reading through the book of Titus. And finally, after six weeks, we finished Titus chapter 1. Thankfully, there's only three chapters. Or you would see me here doing the end of Titus next year at this time. Paul, the writer of Titus, wrote this letter to Titus, whom he left on Crete, the island of Crete, to help set up and organize these churches that Paul had planted there. And in the first chapter, Paul says, okay, Titus, here's what I want you to do to get them organized. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to find elders. I want them to have these character traits, and I want you to set this job description before them, and I want you to make sure that they are men who are willing to not just speak truth, but speak truth and stand up to false teachers. And there are a lot of false teachers going around right now. And Paul proceeded to explain to Titus why they were false teachers, you may remember from last week, these were uh, false teachers were had Jesus and theology. Yes, you can be, yes you can get saved and go have a relationship with God if you surrender to Jesus and do this. These false teachers were getting rich off the Cretans' innocence and their ignorance, and these false teachers were not only te they were not only teaching things that weren't true, but what little truth they gave. Their lives were against it. As Paul said, they, they would do one, say one thing and do another. To sum up, Paul, at, Paul told Titus, these men, these elders, need to be able to stand up to these false teachers for this reason. Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. Byron, can you bring me down just a bit, please? I'm pretty hot. For there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk and deceive others. This is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. They must be silenced, he said, because they are turning whole families away from the truth by their false teaching, and they do it only for money. That kind of sums up why Paul said, we need elders in place who can stand up to these guys and speak truth. So now, now remember, this is a letter. So it's, and I'm, I'm not remembering whether Paul was dictating this or whether he was writing it himself. He probably dictated it. And at this, at, during the letter, he's, he's saying, he's speaking his thoughts just like you and I would. Hey, Titus, great to see you, hope you, or great to write to you, hope you're doing well. I left you on Crete to do this. And this is why I left you on Crete. And these are the types of men I want. And da 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 And he's, he's writing a letter, just like you and I would. And just like any letter, as he gets to a point in the letter where he's done talking about one subject, he kind of segues. And, and said, now these, these guys were doing this. And these guys are bad because of this. But you, Titus. You, Titus. Chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, Titus, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. So he's, he's segueing and saying, okay, Titus, these guys do not reflect wholesome teaching, but you, you promote. You promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. And then Paul spends almost the rest of his letter telling Titus, what does that look like? What does it look like to promote that? What does wholesome living look like? What, is, what does wholesome teaching look like? And this morning, I'm going to cover two reasons why Paul said we must promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Two reasons he told Titus. Now, over the next nine verses, so I'm going to be talking about these two reasons. I'm pulling, pulling things out um, not quite how Paul wrote it, because he wrote a letter and I'm doing a message. So over the next nine verses, what Paul does is he says, this is what you should do in different groups of people. Old men, old women, young women, young men, slaves. 
So he talks about these five groups of people, and he says, this is what you should do. But within the whole second chapter, he also says, this is why you should do it. So we're going to talk about the why first, and we'll get into the what over the next couple of weeks after that. But in the meantime, I want to encourage you to read those nine verses. Some of you read through that last week with me, um, did that whole devotional thing, and that was fantastic. I apologize. I thought I would be going over those nine verses, but as I started search, reading the scriptures and, and studying for this, this week, I really felt God leading me to, to talk about the whys first. So if you did the devotion last week, I apologize. You're ahead by a week. If you didn't do the devotion last week on the YouVersion app, you can do it this week and catch up. And you actually won't be catching up. I'll be catching up with you. Okay? So, um, I encourage you, as you read chapter, verses 2 through 10 of chapter 2 of Titus, put yourself in one of those groups, preferably the right one. <laughs> okay? And if you're wondering, well, none of us are slaves, think of an employer, an employee. If you're an employee... How is, how is Paul suggesting or telling you to live your life? Okay. But the why. Why are we to live lives that reflect wholesome teaching? Why is Paul saying that's a big deal? Why does it matter? Well, first of all, in order to understand that, we have to understand what is a disciple. What is a disciple? Literally speaking, the Greek word, I have no clue what the Greek word is, because I didn't look that up. I just can tell you what the Greek word means. Okay? And the Greek word means disciple, uh, learner, excuse me. Disciple, the Greek word that we translate disciple means learner. Okay? So, if you are a learner and a disciple in Greek, in, in this time frame, which would have been around 30, 40, 50 um, AD. Okay, in this time frame, a disciple was not just somebody who learned. Okay, so when Sherry and I go teach, when Jen goes to teach, she we're not we don't have disciples. We have students, and there is a difference because a disciple didn't just learn their master's philosophy or theology or whatever it was. If you were a disciple of Socrates or of Plato, you didn't just go and read books that they wrote. You went and you lived with them. And you walked with them through the day. Yes, there was some lecturing going on and, and some head knowledge that was transferred from the teacher to the student. That was part of the learning. But a disciple doesn't just get head knowledge. Okay? If you are a disciple of Christ, this is not being discipled. This is part of it. But a disciple would also walk with their master and, and watch their master. And their master would say, I am going to do this, and this is why I'm going to do this, and this is why I believe it's important. And then the master would do it, and the disciple would say, okay, the next time that comes up, I'm going to do that. And a good master, geez, who do we know who is a good master who did this really well? Oh, Jesus, that's a good idea. Okay, if you look at the life of Jesus, you go, oh, Yes, that's what the disciples were doing. Jesus called the 12 disciples, and he said, now come walk with me. And so these guys lived with Jesus for three years. Not because Jesus needed somebody to do the heavy lifting for him when he was tired, but because he wanted to teach them. He wanted them to learn as they lived. And so, yes, there were times when Jesus would talk, talk to them and teach them, and we read about those times. But there were also times where Jesus, first of all, he would do it for them. He would heal somebody. He would pray over people. They would be made whole. He would multiply the loaves and fishes or whatever. But remember those times when, like, when Jesus says, well, you give them something to eat. That was when Jesus was saying, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to do it with you. And that was what a disciple would do. And a master. And then eventually, remember, Jesus sent out the 12, and, and there's another story of him sending out the 70, and he said, go and do this. Go and preach the good news. Tell people the kingdom of God is coming. If you, if you 
Some of you may not have read those stories, but if you read through the Gospels, Jesus eventually said, now you guys go and do it by yourselves. You don't need me all around. And then afterwards, they'd come back, and he'd talk with them, and he'd kind of make some corrections and say, okay, yeah, you did this wrong, or yeah, that was fantastic. Remember when uh, one of the groups came back, he saw, uh, they told him all that they had done, and he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And he really encouraged them and said, good job, you guys. That's a disciple. And we, as disciples of Jesus, we can't be with him physically, but as disciples of Jesus, we have Christ in us. And that is the idea, is that we are learning to walk as Jesus did by listening to the Holy Spirit and reading the Word of God. Yes, this is part of being disciples, but it's also a matter of going and doing because that's what disciples did. Paul talks about this, about the idea that it's about building relationship with your master, not just head knowledge, in a couple of his other letters. He says this in 1 Corinthians 9, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9. He says, God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That whole idea of fellowship, that whole idea of we're supposed to be in relationship with Jesus, not just head knowledge. Philippians chapter 3, 10 through 11, Paul wrote to the Philippians and he said, I gave up all that inferior stuff, all the stuff that I used to do, all of my head knowledge, all of my being a Pharisee, I gave all that up so I could know Christ personally. Okay, so there's that, in, that relationship aspect, but he doesn't stop at the relationship. He says, I want to experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. His whole idea is, I want to do whatever Jesus did. That's the idea of being a disciple, and that, if we have surrendered our lives to Jesus, we have said, God... I want what you've got. God, I need to be set free. God, I need your forgiveness. God, I need to be in relationship with you because you created me. If we've done that, we are saying we are disciples of Jesus. That is the choice we're making. So as disciples, why does Paul say that our lives should reflect wholesome teaching? And why is this a big deal to be different from the false teachers whose lives didn't reflect hope? Well, number one is because Paul wants those watching who are outside the kingdom of God. He wants those who do not know Jesus yet to see that it does make a difference. That it's not just head knowledge. Anybody can be religious. Buddhists have some great religious practices. Muslims have some great religious practices that are all really nice, and, and they're, they're, there's many, many good people amongst a variety of different religions. But our behavior should be so different that the watching world says, that's different. Because we are exhibiting kingdom behavior, kingdom power. The kingdom of God in us coming out through our actions. This is what he says in his letter to Titus, chapter 2, several times as he's explaining why we why the old men should do Excuse this. me, Why's there is a message for you. This? As he's explaining this, this is what he says. Verse 5, then they will not bring shame on the word of God. Verse 8, then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about us. Verse 10, then they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive in every way. The whole point is, Paul is saying, we want God's name to be glorified. Or, to put it in the negative, we want to make sure that God is not embarrassed by us. That our behavior does not shame God and cause people to turn from him. So that's one reason. To put it in the positive, 
We turn to Psalm, uh, Psalms, chapter 34, verse 8. Let me re say that again. We turn to the Psalm 34, verse 8. There, got it out. And the psalmist says this, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. If we want people who don't know Jesus to get hungry to know Jesus, to turn to him, we must live our lives in such a way that, that they're made thirsty and hungry by the, the, the way we live our, live our lives. When I was with Youth Dynamics, I had a boss named uh, Rusty. And Rusty would, um, one of these days I'll explain how all the bosses that I, did, that I had all at once. Rusty would uh, gave us this example. It was a picture of a horse. And you have all heard the saying, I'm sure, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Right. So we can tell people about Jesus all we want. We can drag our kids kicking and screaming to church, and they can hear the pastor. But, but, and, they, and they'll never come to Jesus. Sorry, I need to finish that thought. But, what would happen if you put a salt lick out in, the, out in the corral and just left it, just a salt lick? No food, nothing. Well, most of us who've been around animals know that they'll lick the salt. They, that's something they need. And then they'll keep, keep licking the salt. And maybe we'll give them a little hay or something, or maybe some oats to dry their mouth out. Now, after a few hours of that, or if you really need a day, how long can they go without water? Not very long. Okay. So you put it after a couple hours, now go put a tub of water out there. You won't have to lead the horse. He will run. If we can make people thirsty by our actions to know God, we won't have to, not that any of us would, but we won't have to drag them kicking and screaming. They'll come running. Right now, in our culture today, people are walking away from God. Or at least the God they see and the Christians they see. Because to most people, now, I, I, you can argue with me, well, what about so-and-so that I know and so-and-so? I get it. But to most people in our culture, especially in the cities, what they see is not Christ. What they see is the church embracing a political ideology of one sort or another. And it could be either one. Quite frankly, there are churches that are embracing Democrats. There are churches that are embracing Republicans. And people who are watching this and the conflict that comes about from that are saying, I don't want anything to do with that church because they're about, about politics. I need something that will transform my life, that will change me because I've got this emptiness inside of me that is not working right. And I need something that will transform in me. And Republicans and Democrats just don't have the answer. And we all know that. But right now, people are walking away from the church because we as a church, big, big seat church overall in America, are embracing our politics more than we're embracing Christ in us. So, hypocrites have always been around. Paul had to deal with them. People have to deal with them today. And we have to keep fighting in us. God, help me not to, help me to put it positively, help me to live a life that reflects Christ's character, transforming power, miraculous working in and through me, in and through you, in and through our church. So that's one reason. Why do we need our lives to match our teachings? Because the watching world desperately needs to see that following Christ is different. But the second reason they need to see it is, is simply because God says, I want to transform you. I want to make you more into the image of Christ, but you have to do your part. <coughs> so again, let's go back to the horse again. If the horse is thirsty... 
but it can't get up off the ground because you have let it go too long without water? Okay? You have provided the water, you put it right next to the horse, but if it doesn't get up and drink, it's going to die. All right, that's kind of a lame analogy in this case, but the point is made. We have a part to play. Listen to what Paul has to say to Titus. Chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. God wants to see our lives change, transform from the inside out. Paul wrote to the Colossians saying something similar. He said in chapter 3, he said, If then, you have been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So, let's pause for a minute. Our first response, our, our first reason is all about people watching us. But our second reason is all about God watching us. He's watching us. And if you've had children, you understand the idea that you are watching your children grow up. And you want them to be the best them they could be. God is doing the same with you. And when we have children, we discipline, we correct, we guide, and eventually they turn 18 and we say, get at it! No. We say, and, and they leave the house. And they become adults. And they make their own choices. And we don't always agree with their choices. But they're adults. And we watch them make the choices. They learn from them, hopefully. They make adjustments. And then they have kids of their own. And as grandparents, we get to make fun of them and say, Ha! No, I would never do something like that. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Isn't that what we want our kids to do? Mom, Dad, how do I do this? Oh, I am so glad you asked. Hopefully we don't do that like Bill Cosby did with his kids. Um... Where Christ is seated, if you haven't seen the Cosby show, that just went, phew, never mind. At the right hand of God, seek the things above. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then Paul proceeds to list all these things that are earthly in us. And he says, put them to death. Or in another way of putting it, he says, put it off. Take it off, set it aside. It is just going to distract you. It is just going to not make you into the person I have created you to be. When God made you, he made you with a purpose. He made you to be a certain way, a certain person. And our sin and our sinful tendencies, the works of the flesh, keep us from becoming all that God has made us to be. Then he continues with this statement in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 3. He says, seeing that you have put off the old self, with its practices, and have put on the new self, like a new set of clothing, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. <coughs> and then he spends the rest of chapter 3 sharing what that looks like. What does it look like to put on the new self? How should our lives change to put on the new self? And it's all about his kingdom through us. I was reminded we had dinner with Pastor Kevin at the uh, Blackfoot Christian Fellowship Church. We had dinner with him and his wife Kate. Had a wonderful time. And as pastors do, occasionally we let our wives talk too. But as pastors do, we got talking theology. And, um, and we were talking about this idea of uh, therapeutic moral deism. 
And it's that whole idea that, that people make Christianity and God out to be this person who, okay, the goal of God is to make you feel good and make you have good behavior. And that is the danger of this truth. The danger that we can take it too far and say, well, so all God wants to do is make us good people. All God wants to do is make us feel good. No, 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 no. Uh, yes, but no. Because when that's all God wants to do, that's the religion. That's when you get into religion. You get into people who are saying you're not good enough and you are good enough and, and or um, God just wants to make you feel good and he wants to give you everything you want. And you get into those types of things and that's not at all what God wants for you. Yes, he does want to transform you. Yes, he does have a calling on our lives to put off the old flesh and the garbage, but not because he wants to just make us good people, but because by transforming us and, and us allowing him to transform us, we are being made into what we were created. And we are putting off the things that are destructive, the things that are empty, the things that, that lead to death. And we are putting on the things that lead to life. And in, in Christ, we discover all that he has for us in life. Not just, not just good behavior, but, but transforming power. Filling the emptiness that, that is our flesh. So there are four things. Well, you get to choose which of the four things I would like you to take away from this this morning. The first thing is this, and I, and I don't know that this is true of anybody, but I want to put it out there because it might be true of somebody who's watching it this morning. And that is this. If you want to become a disciple of Christ because you recognize, at the very least, you recognize something is empty in me. Something is not right in me. My heart is not right. I've got this stuff that I'm trying to, to use to fill up this emptiness. Some of it good, some of it destructive, but, but I'm trying to fill up the emptiness, and it's just not working. Becoming a disciple of Jesus, not a disciple of Paul, please. Not a disciple of, of the pastor down the road, but a disciple of Jesus. Surrendering your heart and recognizing that the reason, what has separated us from God is our sin. It is our, it is our nature that is turned away from him. We need to turn back. We need to say, God, I'm sorry. Would you please forgive me because of Jesus and his death on the cross? Would you please forgive me and make me one of yours? That's when we become a disciple. And if you would like to become a disciple, then please, whether it's via Facebook or via uh, email or just coming up and talking to Sherry and I, whatever, please do so. We would love to talk to you more about what it looks like to do that. But if you are already a Christ follower, if you are already a disciple, then the next point, the next question I have for you is, are you walking in relationship with him, or are you walking in information with him? Do you know a lot of what Jesus had to say, and what Paul had to say, but you don't really know Jesus? Then I want to encourage you. Say, Jesus, would you help me to know you? And as you do that, if you will persist and pursue and be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Persevere. If you will persevere, then Jesus will make himself known to you. And as you do that, you will discover the things that he promised. Peace, joy, life, life inside. Not just, not just going to heaven. That's not the point. The point is to experience his kingdom here, now, in your life. So number two, if you're a disciple of Christ, but you don't really know him, ask him to help you know him. Number three, if you are a disciple, 
I want to encourage you to ask Jesus, is there an area of my life, Jesus, that you would like to transform, change, get a hold of that I've been keeping from you, either consciously or unconsciously? Is there an area of, of my life, Jesus, that's a little dark inside because I've got skeletons in the closet and I don't want you to see them? Jesus, would you please point that closet out to me? Help me, Jesus, even, even pull me over there and, and help me to open that and allow you in to clean it out. I will promise you that probably won't be comfortable. In fact, it may be very painful for some. But as you allow Jesus to clean out your closets and as needed, as part of that, bring healing to the wounds that are there, it will be tremendously fulfilling, building of, of him in you. Finally, fourth point. I try to keep it down to two or three, but this one I just couldn't keep it down low. <laughs> I want to encourage you, God, to ask God, God, who do you want me to set an example for this week? Who do you want me to tell about me this week? Who can I share the good news with this week? Or at the very least, invite him to church. Hey, you want to come to church with me? No, I've seen your life. Thank you. Okay, let's go back to number three. Hey, you want to go to church with me? You bet. I'd love to. Remember, depending on the stats you read, and whether they're real or inflated, anywhere from 70 to 90% of the people who attend church, the only reason they come is because somebody invited them. So whichever stat you want to grab, it probably means you know people who won't come unless somebody invites them. So whether it's inviting them to church or just talking to them about how God is changing you, how God has done something for you this week, I want to encourage you. God, would you please open that door for me? And I don't know for any of you what that would look like. I don't even know what it would look like for me. Why I say, go to God. Go to God in that relationship. So, one of those four things. Become a disciple. Be in relationship with God rather than in information stage. Ask Him to transform you, to, to bring to light something that needs to change. Maybe it's a blind spot, in which case... God, would you please show me the blind spot? Because I can't see it. I'm blind. Okay? Or maybe it's, God, show me who I can share your good news with this week. Let's pray. Father, would you please show us how to be examples to others? Would you please open that door? Whether it's at work, or whether it's out on the water, would you please help us to be a light in your, for your kingdom, from your kingdom? God, would you please show us how to do this right? We want to be your ambassadors. Lord, I pray that you would empower us by the Holy Spirit. Baptize us in a fresh anointing out of your Holy Spirit, I pray. Either here or at home or wherever, God, that your Holy Spirit would, would fill us and, and um, empower us to do what you call us to do. In the name of Jesus, I pray.